thank you for coming and joining us on this director's lecture series, the SOAS director's lecture series. Um, it's the first of this calendar year, and we plan to host one every month uh, of the coming academic year. My name is Adam Habib, and I am the director uh, of SOAS. Um, next to me is Andrea Cornwell, uh, the pro-director of research uh, at SOAS. Uh, um, I've asked Andrea to assist me in moderating this event. She is not only a member of our executive team, but she is one of the noted development uh, practitioners and academics uh, in SOAS. I might add, I'm gonna make a blush a little, the most cited or one of the most cited academics uh, at SOAS for many, many years. I wanna also welcome uh, Darren Walker from the Ford Foundation uh, and Mark Malik Brown from the Open Society Foundation, both the friends and colleagues uh, of many years. Uh, they are the CEOs of perhaps the, the more, two private foundations, two of the largest private foundations committed to social justice. Uh, and that is why we've invited them to the seminar, which is looking at about, which is looking at philanthropy and how we can use it to address uh, inequality. Uh, so welcome to Darren and welcome to Malik, uh, Mark Malik Brown uh, from these institutions. Let me start by framing uh, this debate, colleagues. Um, you know, in a sense, one of the greatest challenges of our time, it seems to me, and I think we'd all agree on this, is inequality. Inequality is not simply a problem for the economy or the problem for enabling inclusive development. It is a problem because it has ripple effects through all aspects of society. It politically polarizes a society and it socially polarizes our society. And because it politically and socially polarizes our society, it creates deep alienation. And that deep alienation has manifested itself in the rise of the far right, in the rise of, of communities that are particularly angry and feel excluded from, uh, from the societies in which they're located. And so in a sense, if we are going to uh, begin to address the great challenges of our time, one of the great challenges we have to address is inequality. Uh, and the real question we have to ask is philanthropy. Can philanthropy assist us, assist us in this regard? Now, there are many people who argue against this. They argue that philanthropy is essentially a product of robber barons. It is a product of people who make money in unethical ways and who deeply, uh, who use deeply unethical business practices. And that the huge surpluses that they make, a portion of it is then dedicated to ameliorating the social immiseration that their business practices create. And many people will say, this is not a model for addressing inequality. It's a model for deep, it's a deeply problematic model. And what we should be doing is having far, we shouldn't be allowing those business practices in the first place. And we shouldn't be allowing such, such enormous accumulations of wealth in the first place. And so the big question then becomes, is this reasonable? Now, what I'm going to do is give uh, Darren and Mark an opportunity to say a few words. I'll give each between five and 10 minutes uh, to kick off with their opening statements, their own thoughts on this question. And then, will kind of open up for a conversation between Andrea, myself, Mark, and Darren. Andrea will lead with perhaps the first set of questions and we'll just enable a conversation for about half an hour. Thereafter, we'll go to a series of questions that we've got from the audience. Again, we'll come back to Darren and Mark for a conversation and that should take us to about 7.30 at which I'll end uh, the, the event. So that, if you like, frames the conversation, Darren and Mark. Uh, and let me then start perhaps with Darren, uh, if you're prepared to, to kick off, Darren. Give us a few thoughts about the opening statement, how you would see it, how that informs uh, the ambitions of Ford, how, you, how it informs the philanthropic interventions of Ford. And we can then go to Mark and then open up the conversation. 
Darren. Well, thank you, Adam. It is uh, always great to see you and delighted, of course, to, uh, to be with SOAS and uh, Andrea, uh, a delight to meet you, of course, and have this opportunity. I think your opening statement is quite provocative. Need, needs to be provocative. Philanthropy is indeed in large part a creature of inequality. There is no doubt that if you look over the history of American philanthropy, uh, periods of uh, high levels of inequality created some of the great legacy foundations we know today, Carnegie, Rockefeller, Ford, and so on. There is no doubt, but I do not believe, I reject categorically the idea that philanthropy is incapable of addressing inequality at its root. And so I believe that in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, in a statement he wrote in 1968, just a few weeks before he died, he said the following about philanthropy. Philanthropy is commendable, but it should not allow the philanthropist to overlook the economic injustice which makes philanthropy necessary. And so what Dr. King was saying in some ways, Adam, uh, is a summation of some part of your frame. But he doesn't give up on philanthropy. He simply admonishes and directs those philanthropists to consider the economic injustice and how they can contribute to it or not, and how to calibrate their investments in ways that don't create such disadvantage loss of dignity, inhumanity. And so I believe, as Dr. King did, that it is possible for philanthropy to be not just about charity and generosity, but to be about dignity and justice. And that is why at the Ford Foundation, we call ourselves a social justice philanthropy not because we think we're special or unique or something, but because we do want to call attention to the idea that we're not simply focused on charitable activity or ameliorating the consequences of inequality, but that we actually have to look at the drivers of inequality. And what are those drivers of inequality? We believe they include prejudice, bias, racism, gender inequality and discrimination, cultural norms and practices that create hierarchies and categories that allow some in society to be privileged and others to be disadvantaged. We believe that politics, the ways in which our political systems are designed contributes to inequality. And of course, we believe for a democracy, there is no greater threat to uh, that democracy than inequality. Because at the very highest aspiration of democracy, there must be hope in a society. Inequality asphyxiates hope. Hope is the oxygen of democracy. The ability, as I did as a poor boy living in a rural Texas community in a little shotgun house, my ability to have hope, aspirations, and dream was a function in large part because I lived in an America 
that believed in my potential and invested in ways that demonstrated to me and my poor family that we were worthy and that I, as a young boy enrolling in the first Head Start class in the summer of 1965, a new government program designed to lift up poor boys and girls like me in America. I believed because of those investments that my country was cheering me on. And what you speak of today, Adam, so eloquently is the fact that in many societies, people who have been disadvantaged, people who have been left out and left behind by an economy that is quickly transforming they do not believe their country is cheering them on. In fact, they believe that for many of them, their country, their government has become the problem. And that indeed their government seems to be set up, designed to implement and execute programs and policies that seem to get in the way of advancing them. And so, Philanthropy's role in this is to do the research, support the advocacy and the policy that helps us name, frame, and surface the real drivers of inequality and help to support those ideas and institutions and individuals who are indeed developing the solutions to show us how we can get out. So philanthropy's role in many ways, in my view, is to be the financier for the kinds of innovation, social ingenuity, the difficult conversations that won't happen without capital that's risk capital. Those conversations, those ideas, those innovations that can't necessarily be solved by market solutions won't be funded without philanthropy. So we have a critical role to play. And as I turn over the podium to my friend, Lord Malak Brown, I certainly have learned from him and the work that he has done and certainly the work at OSF, uh, an institution that uh, I will say with some trepidation has pushed us from being the second largest foundation to the third largest. Um, but I'm not envious or green or any such thing, am I, Mark? Uh, right. so, so that's lovely, uh, Darren, thank you very much. That's a, those are useful comments. Mark, um, in a lot of ways, OF, uh, OSF, uh, is formally committed to the open society and the notion of the open society. And I would imagine that you would see inequality as a serious threat to the open society because it kind of creates the political and social conditions uh, that, that Darren has, has, has spoken of. Well, how would you put, uh, how would you see the challenge? Well, thank you. And it great to be, thank you both for, for, for hosting us and thank you, Darren, for kicking us off. So as usually eloquently, um, look, I'm, OSF and I are both relatively new to this compared to Ford and Darren, because, you know, we are a new generation foundation, if you like, 30 years old, uh, not at, at all uh, uh, with the same sort of storied history that Ford has. And I myself am, you know, a long time board member of OSF, but only, you know, a rookie foundation president. I've only been doing it for a little bit more than a year, but it does, because previously I'd been lucky enough to have senior jobs in the UN, uh, in the World Bank, in the UK government, you know, I do have a chance to reflect on both the advantages of being a foundation president and also the challenges and the you know advantage I think is very very clear which is you have a much simpler set of if you like ownership 
uh, than if, for example, you're at the UN with 190 plus governments to be accountable to. You know, here you have uh, a founder and the board that founder has assembled. But of course, that very clarity of ownership poses, as you touched on in your opening, Adam, questions of, of, of legitimacy as well. You know, a large fortune now redeployed to these philanthropic purposes. You know, is it solution or is it indeed part of the problem uh, in the first place? And of course, it won't surprise you that I, like Darren, I uh, think it can be very much uh, part of the solution. And, you know, I take my particular philanthropist founder, George Soros, now 91, and I'd say two things about him, but, you know, every foundation founder has in a way their own history, their own motives that have driven them to philanthropy at this scale. Uh, but in George's case, you know, fleeing twice from Nazism, from communism, a Jew persecuted in Central Europe who made his way uh, to London and to a first university education uh, in London at the LSE before getting going on to America and making a vast fortune in the financial markets. But for him, you know, by the midpoint in his career, you know, he was keen to be giving it back. He was a creature of violent social change. He wanted to, in a sense, you know, invest in, you know, a much more positive social change, an opportunity for others to journey as he had through the most extraordinary life, really. And, you know, so his foundation very much reflected his personal history, but not just in its purposes, which are very much around uh, issues of social inequality as being critical to an open society, but also in its philosophical tenet, uh, this premise of open society assumed that nobody has a monopoly on the truth or wisdom, uh, that debate, the clash of ideas is, you know, where the closest to truth comes from, but that it is always challenged and advanced by that continuing debate. And so for us as OSF, you know, there is a sort of, if you like, built in reflex against, you know, just being any kind of agent of one man's agenda or, or of one class or elite's agenda. You know, we are absolutely dedicated to the principle of the fallibility of human judgment and knowledge, uh, and uh, the fact that the way you address fallibility is to allow the clash of ideas and debate. And it's why, for example, we invest so heavily in the university space, because we think universities are so key to uh, the, the sort of human capital of societies. But, you know, I think behind that, too, though, lies, and to come in directly on the inequality point, a recognition that, you know, if, if our foundation was very much in the years of the fight against apartheid in South Africa and of against communism in, in, in Central Europe, and in both cases, we wanted to stimulate both change and debate uh, around that change. You know, we saw so clearly that inequality had contributed to it. And if we take a lesson from the 30 years since, it's how, you know, the failure to address inequality by successor regimes and governments in those countries, even if they are more democratic and more open and more devoted to the rights of their citizens, they remain fundamentally at jeopardy because they've not been able to address this issue of a more inclusive model of growth, a more inclusive vision of rights. So for us, these are very much front of mind uh, issues. And I suppose the last point to say is, I think every day that I and my colleagues go to work, and you know, every day George Soros now, as I say at 91, thinks about us and his son Alex, our deputy chairman, you know, uh, thinks about what we are doing. We realize that the continued claim we can make to legitimacy 
comes from having impact around these issues in constantly finding groups who are left behind by government. Uh, when I would cite, for example, the work we do with the Roma in, in Europe as a clear expression of that work we've been doing for 25 years, uh, or groups for whom, who, who, who's whose needs need to be brought to the attention of government because they've been overlooked. So that foundation as moral voice, as challenger to governments to have a more inclusive vision of growth, to respect the rights of all. You know, we see that as our claim to legitimacy, that we are, you know, if you like, uh, as single-minded in our pursuit of uh, social justice, as we can be. Uh, and if we fall away from that gold standard, uh, then I think we rightly allow our critics to raise the question, what are you about? What is your motives? What are your purposes? Is there a hidden agenda? Uh, we need to put our campaign for social justice. We need to wear it on our sleeve. We need to be clear about it every day. Uh Thank you. Um, so uh, we're going to bring in, we've had uh, some really interesting questions sent to us. So um, we're going to bring in some of those questions and the questions that we ask as we go forward. So um, I, one of the questions was very similar to one which I thought would be really interesting to put to you. And um, so I'm going to adapt it a bit. Um, so the question is, uh, an inherent risk in private philanthropy is that it ex exonerates government from its duty to ensure socioeconomic rights and justice. So um, it potentially undermines the accountability of governments to their citizens. Um, both of you have spoken about that relationship between um, representation to government and the kind of advocacy that you enable. And I think it's an interesting question to ask you, how do foundations like the OSF and board guard against the risk of playing a palliative role in an unjust system um, rather than a transformative one? And the kind of things that you are doing in order to be able to try and address, as, as Darren said, those sort of deep levers of change uh, without undermining the accountability of governments to their citizens. Darren? Well, I think we both, uh, OSF and Ford, um, support institutions and people who are committed to holding government to account. Uh, some of these organizations uh, are deeply committed to addressing issues of, of impunity, of corruption, um, of kleptocracy. Um, these, uh, this is why Ford and OSF are often in trouble, if you will, uh, because indeed uh, we are deemed by, uh, by some governments as problematic. Uh, we have certainly both institutions been sanctioned uh, by uh, various governments over the years because of our support uh, of, of these institutions. I think the challenge is we could do more, but I think the challenge is for philanthropy to do more in this regard. Uh, I don't think that, uh, again, I, I don't mean to sound braggadocious, or, but, but I, I don't think there are many foundations committed to funding that kind of work. Uh, the work that really excavates uh, some of these root causes and the ways in which governments, uh, particularly uh, authoritarian regimes that are democratically uh, elected, uh, a trend we're seeing more and more uh, these days, uh, democracies that are quasi-authoritarian, uh, and the way in which you address these issues of impunity, of systemic uh, inequality in those systems uh, in, uh, are, more, are far more complex uh, and complicated than in, than in a straightforward uh, authoritarian dictatorship. Mark? Well, look, I, I think first, you know, there's just a, a one very practical, pragmatic point to make. Uh, the resources of foundations, and as Darren said, you know, we are the second and third largest uh, f foundation of our, of our kind, um, our resources are a drop in the ocean compared to those of government. So, you know, just very practically, uh, it would be hard for us to let government off the hook in terms of large scale service provision. Um, and 
you know, and in a sense that always focuses our mind, you know, what can we do? What can we campaign for? What can our grantees do, which will spur government to expand its provision to reach those currently unreached uh, by its services? Because there really is no other model. I mean, I, I think that argument can be made more more really to corporates about you know this whole thing about corporate social responsibility and is that a substitute for government service provision because that's sort of more matching to economic forces of a similar scale but we are we are ultimately small um you know we in our case spend well north of a billion dollars a year um which is a very large and privileged philanthropic spend uh, to, 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 to have oversight of, but you know it, it uh, you know it's an accounting error in 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 a government's uh, national accounts. So, um, you know, as I say, the, the challenge therefore is you know not how to and if you send uh, to exonerate government from its responsibilities, it's how to use our grant making to to, in a sense, spur government to accept its responsibilities. And there, Darren's point about the sort of pretty radical uh, grant making that both our organizations do, and where I think, you know, I often look over my shoulder to make sure Ford's right there at our side. And I like to think Darren occasionally looks over his shoulder to make sure OSF is there, because we do think of ourselves as the two most courageous uh, donors around these kinds of agendas of inclusion, anti-corruption, the issues that, that, that Darren mentioned. So, okay, I'm, I'm, forgive me, I'm going to push the boundaries a little, Darren and, and Mark. So, um, so I think you're both absolutely right. Uh, I mean, it seems to me that the dilemma of development anywhere in the world is how do you empower the disempowered? Because if the disempowered had power, political and economic elites would become responsive to them. They would begin to uh, respond to their needs, respond to their demands, et cetera. And so actually development is less about policy, although that's important. It's less about systems, although that is important, but it's about figuring out how you can get poor people or marginalized communities power because if they have leverage, then powerful elites in the state or in the economy become responsive to them. And so that poses a really interesting dilemma for social justice philanthropists, because what you've got to do is invest in a way that enables the empowerment of the disempowered. And so in a sense, it seems to me, it's less about the the kinds of policy work that you sponsor from people like my organization. Uh, and it's far more about how you make sure that marginalized communities are, in, are allowed to mobilize, are allowed to organize, because it's through their mobilization and organization, they get a collective voice that people become responsive to them. And so that, it seems to me, is the real kind. Now that raises two dilemmas which I'd like you to respond to. One is, do you empower community organizations, social struggles, as opposed to NGOs, advocacy organizations? And is there a way you do that? Do you get the mix right? And how do you determine that? The second is what you touched on, Darren. And that is, I'm sure when you start doing this, you, uh, get political and economic elites unhappy. And they then begin to take action against you. Uh, we've seen in the case of OSF, the action in Hungary uh, at various points in the early ages, I recall in the early 2000s, uh, the Bush regime in the United States imposed quite significant constraints on how much private foundations should spend and what they spend on. It seems to me, how do you manage so the second question is, how do you manage the political and economic elites acting against you? So the first question, is there a proportion, is there a way that you're empowering community organizations, social movements against NGOs? 
And the second is how do you manage the, the tensions that inevitably arise with political elites? Perhaps I should switch the order this time, Mark, and then Darren. Great. I've always been hoping that the one moment I could go ahead of Darren, he's very hard to follow. He's always answered it all. So, um, so let, let me just say that, you know, Darren described Ford as, as, as a sort of social, social justice foundation. You know, we deliberately go perhaps half a step further. Uh, and, you know, there are, it, it's quite a complex issue, but we call ourselves a political philanthropy. Um, and, um, you know, it's complex in terms of, you know, status you register for and exactly how your funds are structured in the US. So it, it, it's something we can call ourselves, but you know, others, it's hard for them to do it. But we, 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 we sort of revel in the term and we revel in it really for, for both the reasons that, that your questions that you raise, Adam. I mean, you know, we do like you believe that political change has to come from empowerment. And, you know, a, a, a lifetime ago when I was head of the UN Development Program, I remember a countryman of yours, uh, South Africa's ambassador to the UN, um, standing up in a board meeting of, of UNDP when I was its head and saying, um, you are no longer going to dig shallow wells in South Africa. Instead, you're going to invest in democracy and empowerment um, because you believe that is the way the poor uh, will, will get out of you know, the trap they're in. And you know, I answered affirmatively to his surprise because UN development had been a very tame affair where you did um, latrines and, and wells and maybe classrooms. And, you know, I tried to, in a much more limited way than is possible at OSF, you know, put UNDP onto a political purpose by making it about democracy and uh, expansion of democracy. And, you know, I don't think even then, and I certainly don't now think that just extending the vote alone uh, breaks through. I think, you know, we're seeing just how challenged the democratic model is in many parts of the world, including the US uh, at the moment. But this issue of what are the keys to empowerment uh, remains at the core of my lifetime uh, involvement in this, but very much what I find at OSF. I don't think to take the first question, it's movements or NGOs. It's using NGOs often as vehicles to reach movements. Um, you know, there are a lot of NGOs now who are themselves, you know, the agents of supporting and encouraging the growth of social movements uh, in developing country, countries and elsewhere. And, you know, that's very much the nexus we're looking at. You know, we're less and less looking at NGOs as independent international actors. We're looking at them as part of a fabric of building a strong uh, social movement base in countries. And, you know, I think that is key to the second point, the, the capture by political and economic elites. Yeah, I mean, OSF and for that matter, Ford, you know, have always been, you know, dangerous company for the eyes of elites and you know it's not just Hungary where we confront difficulties in OSF's case there is a very large range of countries where it has become very hard for us to work um, and you know there are several countries where just in the last year as part of political change we've had to leave Afghanistan and Myanmar um, you know I've spent much of today checking on the security arrangements for our staff in Ukraine um, and so you know, there is no doubt that I hope we're towards the end of it, but there has been a tide in recent years that goes much wider than ourselves, but which has been, you know, intolerant of challenges to establish power. And, you know, I think we, at the one level where it is a bit of a badge of honor that, you know, autocrats go after us so often and blame us for color revolutions, uh, Mr. Putin's favorite claim against us. Um, but on the other hand, it forces us to reflect a bit about, are we getting something wrong? Uh, that this rise of authoritarianism, you know, has marched as far as it has in, in, in 
the last decade or so. You know, this is a not just a much less hospitable world for OSF uh, than the world of 15 years ago. It's a much less hospitable world for those whose corner we're seeking to fight. And so, you know, I think we face some some fundamental questions about strategy and effectiveness in today's world. Darren? Well, I think uh, when you have a clear point of view, your theory of change, if you will, you understand that these uh, situations of NGOs and movements are not either or, uh, they are both needed grassroots and grass tops. You have to have strategy for both. And this issue of empowerment is important because we have to talk about uh, a driver uh, is uh, of inequality is the lack of willingness to share power. We have to talk about power. And I was with a group of philanthropists who once this one of them said, well, we are, we are in the business of giving voice to the voiceless. And I've heard that often. Uh, and I challenged the philanthropist, actually uh, poor and marginalized people, their, their communities, they have voices. We have simply not been willing to hear them, to listen to them. We have uh, privileged the credentialed uh, from places like New York and Washington and Geneva and London, their perspectives over those who are most proximate in community. And so it's why we at Ford, and I know the same can be said for OSF, uh, spend so much of our resources, our grant making dollars on community-based organizations, on grassroots organizations, uh, on uh, institutions, organizations led by people of color, led by formerly incarcerated people in your justice program, uh, not to in any way uh, diminish the critical importance uh, of credentialed knowledge. It is just simply to say that it is out of balance and that we need to reconsider that calibration. Uh, I also uh, am as Mark described, at Ford, we have uh, a long history uh, of being both an elite institution ourselves and challenging the elite. I have in my office uh, a placard from uh, New Orleans in 1961. Across the country, there were full page advertisements taken out in Southern newspapers. And the a uh, headline said, attention white citizens, boycott the Ford Motor Company because the profits from this company are going to a New York foundation seeking to force white Southerners to integrate with Negroes and force us to change our way of life. And so for decades, we have been on the receiving end uh, of vitriol and anger uh, and uh, penalties because indeed uh, we have, uh, as an elite institution, uh, stood uh, for something. But that doesn't mean that we uh, rest on our laurels or that we um, think of ourselves as, as so incredibly special. In fact, I believe uh, there is more of uh, a necessity of challenging some of those very systems that have made us an elite institution, beginning with our wealth. Um, and it's why uh, we focus today uh, on looking at the issues of economics, economic injustice, and even talking, engaging on the issue of the intersection of capitalism and democracy. We cannot address the issue of inequality through social policy alone. We have to really look at the economic systems and structures that reproduce 
generation after generation, advantage, compounded advantage for some and compounded disadvantage for others. At a macro level, you can look at the United States going back to slavery and generation after generation, look at the way our economic system was designed and that economic system and the systems of democracy, which often conspired to render descendants of slaves always disadvantaged. And that history remains with us today going back to the original promise of 40 acres and a mule, which no freed slave ever received, all the way through the redlining of black neighborhoods in America in the 1950s and 60s, so that capital would be prevented from going into those communities, private capital, investment capital that went into creating wealth for white Americans were choked off from, the, from black communities literally miles away. So we have to look at the systems of our economy if we are to really get at the root causes. And that makes us all nervous, makes us all vulnerable. It makes us all, certainly we capitalists, it makes us all as it should. It should make us really consider uh, whether fairness, uh, justice, equality uh, are values we, we believe in or practice. So I want to um, bring us back to some of the points that both of you have raised about the power of movements and movement building um, and the, the, the uh, grassroots, grass tops um, empowerment and thinking about the innovations that you've brought to grant making practices, but also some of the hazards of grant making practices that um, do something that's been um, particularly uh, referred to as the NGOization of social movements, where people are bound into limited time frames, a lot of reporting, and so on. And also where decisions are made not necessarily by the people or aligned with the things that, uh, that the people at the grassroots might have as their, um, their strategies. So how have you innovated in your grant making practices to avoid some of those hazards and, and to align your grant making uh, with social movements and with, um, and with these kinds of social actors who you're trying to be able to foster? Again, Dallin? Well, I think there are a few things um, that, that we do. When, when, you, when you say innovative, Andrea, I don't want to uh, make it sound as if these are radical things. To my mind, they're commonsensical if you believe in the rhetoric that we espouse. So first is who you fund. Uh, fund the grassroots, Gen generally, well, genuinely grassroots. Uh, organizations who are authentically based in communities and have in their governance, their staff, representatives of the people most proximate to the challenge the opportunity you've identified to work on. Two, uh, how you fund them. Fund them with general operating support. Fund them with, if you believe in empowerment, you are investing in their ideas. They may need a strategy consultant, possibly, fine. Provide a technical assistance grant so they can get a strategic advisor, but it's their vision that we're investing in with unrestricted support. Uh, do it multi-year. This is something I faced when I uh, became president of Ford and, and what I was told by our finance people and our general counsel was, well, the trustees only uh, authorize a one-year budget, so you can't do multi-year grants because the trustees only authorize a one-year budget. My response was, well, the trustees can change that. They're the trustees. This was Mark's point earlier about the difference in, between UNDP and, and OSF and Ford. The trustees can change whatever they want. I mean, if the trustees want to do two-year, three-year, four-year budgets, they can approve budgets, multi-year budgets. You just have to make the case to your board to do that. So 
I, I was fortunate in that I made the case with my CIO, with the, with the chief investment officer, uh, demonstrating the efficacy and the risk mitigation to be put in place. Um, and, and it allowed us then to move to multi-year uh, grant making. Um, it supports, again, it, it is when you talk about empowerment, we've gone from what was less than 20% to now over 80% of our grants as general operating support. Um, that has been a challenge because um, the other little secret that we don't wanna talk about is the ways in which we in philanthropy like to quote unquote control our grantees. And that's clear. I mean, it's not a secret. You just need to look at, as you say, Andrea, the reporting requirements. It's so much about tell us what we need, not tell us what you need um, and how we can together determine what's the best way for you to report. Uh, how do we think about aggregating reporting from any number of foundations? We're funding and OSF is a part of it, a process to look at multi-funder reporting so that there doesn't need to be a separate report for Ford, OSF, Gates, and Hewlett, that actually we all together might accept one report from uh, the grantee. So those are just a few ways. Finally, participatory grant making. Uh, how do we think about ways that actually put in the driver's seat of, of determining who receives the grant so we're doing some experiments, really interesting experiments uh, around this question of participatory grant making. Mark? Um, I, first, I mean, I think the answer has, in a way, as Darren has said, both, if you like, a kind of technocratic component to it and a philosophical one. The technocratic one is, you know, how do we just simplify our grant making processes and make them more multi-year? And, you know, I was, I sort of let loose some consultants rather controversially on the inside of OSF when I started and found that our grants were on average smaller than Ford's uh, for a shorter period of time. And that grantees were have, bearing a huge costs, transaction costs of securing renewals. So, you know, I, I have been all about trying to get grants for longer periods of time and larger amounts of money. Um, but of course, there are a couple of tensions and trade-offs that you inevitably and run up against as you do these kinds of things. I mean, first, you know, actually, as you increase grant size, there is a risk that you migrate towards the more established grantees. You know, a part of the OSF shtick has been our ability to sort of find grantees at the very beginning of their journey towards institutionalization, to find them first. We're incredibly proud of our local knowledge, et cetera. So we have to be careful about that. The second thing is a tension between, um, uh, you know, if you like, trying to empower the grantees in ways that Darren has just described, and a sense that we are in a moment of great global crisis where freedoms are under threat around the world and where we need compelling narratives of change that we're all collectively signed up to, that we are working together to resist authoritarianism, for example. And, you know, that sometimes seems to cut across this empowerment of grantees to write their own ticket, if you like, and, and, and take their own journey. And so managing you know, a relationship with a grantee where you move from just, and I think the way to bridge it is to build a relationship where you move from just being the check writer to partners in change. Uh, in really making ch deep-seated change. And if you can lift the dialogue between the two sides to that, uh, then I think you can kind of square the circle. You can both empower grantees while securing that you are all, in a sense, signed up to the same theory of change. Uh, because if we disperse our efforts and you know really allow the sort of thousand flowers to bloom strategy, there is a risk that, you know, the very well-organized forces of authoritarianism continue to roll their tanks 
onto our front lawns and through our towns. And, and so we've got to find ways of resisting that, which, as I say, allow us to come together uh, in a fairly disciplined way. So, you know, these are the sort of challenging trade-offs that I think, you know, make our jobs so interesting ultimately. And I, uh, so, I mean, uh, before uh, Andrea comes in with some of the questions from the, the participants in the, in, the, in, in the session, can I just take the, di the direction of the conversation slightly differently? And really, yes, as, and I want to do so in part because of what SOAS is. SOAS is in many ways an institution in the North, but it's meant to partner institutions in the South. It seems to me that when we talk about inequality, inequality has multiple dimensions. It's inequality at the very local level in the municipal uh, level. You'll have inequality at the level of the nation. You have inequality at the level of the globe. And in a sense, the question I wanted to ask is whether both organizations are sufficiently aware of this and does this inform their practice? I recall, uh, and my board of trustees will not be pleased by my saying this, but you know, I recall when I was in, in South Africa as, at, the, at the University of Adventist, one of the things that you'd, would annoy me is foundations would give money to Northern institutions to then pass on the money to Southern institutions. So in a very way, you were consolidating the very inequality in the global academy that you were meant to be addressing uh, and you said you were addressing. And so the question I'm posing to, to both Ford and OSF is, are you aware of this? Does it, this inform the way you practice the distribution of resources across the, the North-South divide? And are you thinking through the support of institutions in the South? And if you are, how do you deal with the multiple other myriad of challenges, which comes with systems, accountability, the kinds of uh, whether they are appropriate uh, systems to manage uh, the accountability of those resources. Should we switch again, Mark? Kick off with you. Sure. Well, look, this is, it's a nice one, Adam, because you know obviously OSF has always focused hugely on a local presence and local knowledge. I mean. Uh, you know, we, we, we are unique actually in the foundation world of, of having close to 50 offices around the world, uh, uh, even if we've lost a lot, a couple in recent years. Uh, and um, we've done that because George Soros felt both that that local presence was important, that local boards of, uh, you know, advisors in countries and in sub-regions was important, all as the way we had that sort of local, if you like, finger on the pulse, that real understanding of local context. And the change that has probably been most controversial that I have made inside OSF, along with this sort of reform of grant making that we just discussed, is really trying to, you know, invert uh, our structure, our sense of organizational priority and presence from what I call an American foundation with an international network to a global foundation. Uh, we have realigned our spending to now be spent by regions uh, in the region uh, through a network of countries and sub-regional uh, presences in those regions. Uh, and all of this is about you know, shifting the sort of weight, our weighting, if you like, from north to south. Uh, and yes, I mean, it goes without saying, Adam, that we take your point entirely about, you know, not sort of funneling money through northern institutions for it just to go uh, to, to, to southern ones. But I think, you know, the critique of inequality we have, you know, and that I certainly personally embrace uh, is one which starts with you know, massive global inequality at one end or finishes, if you like, with massive global inequality at one end and begins or starts uh, with massive inequalities at the individual, community, family, societal level uh, at, at the other. And, and we have to sort of tackle 
all dimensions of that. So yes, I mean, you couldn't have bold me a nicer one because you know I, I i think we're completely on side with how you see that darren well i think um first we have to acknowledge that it has only been in recent years that foundations have committed uh, ourselves to focusing on inequality uh, inequality was not the focus of the ford foundation until recently um and we as a legacy foundation uh are indeed a product of a system that was designed, the Bretton Woods system, a system that was designed of development that had at its core some patronizing features, uh, a system that uh, privileged uh, elite institutions, capacity building institutions for the South and it seems that after decades, the real capacity that's been built has been in the North. And so we have all of these amazingly uh, dazzling endowed institutions in the North uh, who were supposed to have executed uh, transfers of capacity to the South. And we've not seen that. And so absolutely, there is no doubt that this is a product, but it's a problem of something that is endemic to a system that itself needs to be reconsidered and reimagined. And that is indeed our system of international finance and development, which is rooted in some of these ideas, ideas that my own institution have propagated. So when I look at our own practices, I have to ask ourselves, how is it that we, for decades, you could not be a grant maker in our Brazilian office and be Brazilian? The staff in the Brazilian office who were responsible for grant making were Americans and Europeans. The same goes for Africa. And even if I double click and say, and why is it that when we did hire Brazilians as grant makers, they were always European Brazilians. They were never Afro-descendant Brazilians or indigenous people. Why is that? Why is it that we did not, we use language that was, that was colonial, we called the head of our office, offices in Africa representatives. This was, this was something out of, out of the Raj era uh, uh, in, in India and the, the, the UK or so. I mean, it is, it is these ideas that, that were so deeply embedded into our cultural normative thinking about the way to organize ourselves, the way to look at these ideas of development. Um, I think uh, we, we are seeing the harm that was done by, by some of that. And so Adam, what you describe is completely, uh, and the frustration you experience uh, is completely uh, normative for people like you who were on the receiving end of what was supposed to be uh, the development that would help lift up your country and your region. There is no doubt, uh, final answer, there is no doubt that we understand inequality at the community, uh, country, regional, global level, but we have to therefore understand the macroeconomic system because what is happening in uh, Soweto, or what is happening in Gary, Indiana, what is happening in Bangalore, are all the functions of macroeconomic policy and design that is considered at the highest levels often, but are not considered uh, at the lowest, the, the, the most micro level. Um, because of course, at the macro level, um, we elites, we're all winners. At the micro level, 
the people who are the losers is are, are why we're seeing what we're seeing today in our politics, as you uh, noted in your beginning uh, comment, Adam. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we've had loads of really good questions. So I'm gonna pick up on a couple of the questions um, and put them to you. Actually, you've been answering the questions um, as you've been talking. <laughs> Some of them relate directly to what two of you have just been saying. So uh, there's a question here from uh, Rara Murray Kolyamatol, um, who uh, on indigenous climate injustice, and he says um, he's um, honoring your ancestors, his ancestors and the ancestors of the lands where we stand and said, hello. Um, and thank you, Darren, for your heartfelt response. It res resonates with my childhood and current efforts. And the question is about what the foundations, your two foundations are doing uh, to address global indigenous climate injustice and to mitigate climate change's threat and the multiplier effects that exacerbates structural and systemic injustices on communities of color because it permeates and compounds existing public health, economic, educational and criminal injustices around the world and in the United States. So he wants to hear a bit more about climate injustice and how both of your foundations are tackling it as part of this um, global picture that we're talking about. Karen? Well, certainly I believe, um, and, and we believe at Ford, that uh, a key solution to the climate crisis is the empowerment of indigenous people over their land to have sovereignty uh, and guardianship of their land. And if we are to actually uh, achieve uh, the, the, the uh, aspirations uh, that were articulated at, at, in, in Glasgow, uh, this cannot be achieved without investing in the institutions, uh, the governance, the capacity building of those very indigenous peoples organizations, of which there are dozens across the planet that are under-resourced. For the first time, uh, we were able to uh, amass a billion six uh, directed towards the issue of, uh, of guardianship of uh, indigenous people's lands. But what we are focused on at Ford is ensuring that a disproportionate amount of that money go directly to those organizations and their communities. If we do that, they will have the power, uh, the position to be heard because we believe when they are heard, justice will be found. We will find our way towards more uh, solutions that are justice oriented. Um, the problem has been we have invisibilized them. We've been unwilling to hear them. We've been unwilling to listen to their voice or to believe that uh, indeed uh, giving them power uh, is, 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 is a strategy that that's a win-win. And it is. Mark? Well, Look, frankly, OSF was a little late to the issue of climate justice, but we're trying to make up for it. Uh, George Soros felt for a while that there were a lot of new foundations coming into the climate space and that, you know, relatively there was more foundation money going into this area than others. So despite his own personal concern about the climate, he held back for a while. Well, he we was right. He was right. I mean, there were yeah. more, there were lots of new foundations coming to the climate space. He wasn't wrong to, to yeah, make that let's assessment. Say that. No, exa exactly, Dan. But I think what we realized in looking at the space was an awful lot of that new foundation money goes to uh, climate um, sort of strategies in the global north. Uh, and it is not reaching developing countries, particularly not reaching the kinds of communities that the questioner was asking about. So we decided we would set up a climate program targeting exactly those kinds of communities. And, you know, so the first places that we're working in is, you know, we're working in Brazil and the Amazon. Uh, we're working, we're putting together a program in the Caribbean. Uh, we're tackling some big issues of energy transition, like in South Africa, uh, but we're trying to do things that we felt had escaped 
the kind of foundation funding support which was needed and to find uh, the groups who certainly uh, had gone unheard, uh, to use Darren's word. So we very much, you know, that is our strategy to reach those kinds of communities, uh, to help them uh, with uh, strategies to contain the damage of climate change and to take ownership uh, of their own futures and to enable them uh, to do that. Thank you. And I'm going to ask uh, just uh, another question. I'm going to run a couple of questions together, actually. So one, um, one person wrote in saying, how do you square the undeniable power held by philanthropic organisations and wealthy individuals to overpower democratic systems and therefore democratic processes? Um, how do you as social justice supporting organisations hold yourself accountable without any systems in place to do so? Is it even possible? Um, and the next person, a similar set of, of issues around uh, the extent to which philanthropic foundations, including Ford and OSF, are subsidised with public money. Um, both of your foundations have supported participatory grant makers where the decisions about where funding goes are made by the people most affected. How else can philanthropy become more democratic and accountable? bearing in mind that the fact that money you spend comes in part from the tax paying public. So these broader questions here of accountability, how do you hold yourself to account? How can others hold you to account? Um, and how are you accountable to, to citizens and taxpayers for the things that you fund? Mark, do you wanna come in this time? Sure, uh, you know, really good questions and important questions about the role of foundations uh, in, in society uh, and you know, I, I think, you know, ultimately, as we both, you know, hinted at in our earlier answers, you know, the ultimate accountability is impact. Uh, it is being doing things that taxpayer uh, based public sector organizations couldn't do and achieving results which otherwise would not be achieved for society. And I do think you know, transparency around that, how we're using our resources, being very clear in our reporting about where our resources are going, reporting in uh, the impacts we hope and believe we've achieved, you know, starts to build out uh, that kind of accountability. It is true, of course, that, you know, monies that have gone into the endowment of these foundations, you know, have often been on these highly tax advantageous terms uh, in that, that, you know, it is money put without, if you like, you know, put pre-tax, not post-tax. But remember, it is then money, you know, out of the control you know, or, or hands of the original founder. And, you know, you are seeing the regulatory environment around foundations properly getting stronger in both the UK and to some extent in the US uh, to ensure that there really is both financial transparency of reporting, uh, but clarity and accountability uh, around results. But, you know, ultimately, I think we come back to the fact that, you know, in a world where you just had public sector organizations controlling uh, the provision of funding in all these areas, would you get the same innovation, the same prospect of piloting new ideas, the same championing of uh, excluded groups that you can get with a component of your spends in these areas coming from, you know, enlightened private philanthropy. And so I suppose in that case, you know, while I recognize the, you know, the, the, the real legitimacy and importance of the questions asked, I think the answer has to be judge us by results. And, you know, then to the final point of, you know, is the only kind of dem democratic accountability allowing our grantees, you know, as much leeway as possible because of their own accountability to the communities that they are part of as social movements. Yes, I think that's an important part of it, but I think it is a sub part of, as I say, uh, this bigger challenge. Can we demonstrate convincingly to all our stakeholders that we are an effective force for progressive change? Because that really is our final, if, if you like, our core claim on for legitimacy. Okay. Karen? I would just say that this accountability starts with governance. Uh, we have to look at our boards. 
Uh, it's one of the real challenges that we have in the United States. Uh, many of the foundation's boards themselves are not very representative of society. That's a problem uh, in a democracy when uh, transparency, accountability, uh, representation uh, is, is so critical to trust. Uh, so it is most certainly, um, and I think we have made some progress at Ford. We have, we have work to, to do, but when you're working on uh, issues of criminal justice reform, for example, uh, racial uh, discrimination, and you've got uh, people uh, like uh, Brian Stevenson uh, or Paolo Morana or, or uh, Bayo Ogabende. I mean, you, you, you find that you uh, do have authentic understanding of the, of the real challenges. Uh, but as I say, we have work to do. There's no doubt that part of this in terms of funding is doing the kind of funding that actually could make the institution uncomfortable. Uh, we, we funded just in the last two years projects around accountability on everything from um, uh, ESG and private equity, uh, which is a major source of income for the Ford Foundation. Um, and, and we funded a report that, that really called into question some of the practices of private equity. Uh, we funded a report that um, helped to lead us to actually make the decision to, um, to withdraw from investing in fossil fuels, even though from an investment standpoint uh, for many years, we had remained an investor in that space. Uh, we funded, uh, we're funding a report now that is um, highly disfavored by, by much of philanthropy uh, that has a set of proposals about everything from uh, payout uh, uh, rate to uh, donor advised funds that uh, the, uh, the National uh, Council on Foundations has come out in very strong opposition to. Uh, that, that was funded by the Ford Foundation. Um, and, and, and it has not put us uh, in a position of favor with, with some of our peers. But it was important to actually uh, allow th these who would be doing real critical analysis of our practices, of the policies that, uh, that, that allow us to continue to have this privilege, um, to demand more in terms of accountability um, and, and so I, I'm proud. I think we have much more to do, but I have to be clear, Andrea, we're never going to find the perfect calibration of, of power and engagement and empowerment um, and participation. Um, these ideas uh, are, uh, they are, they are contested within the, 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 the space of philanthropy. And I think that's as it should be. If you believe, as I do, that a democracy needs is a three-legged stool. You've got to have a strong, vibrant government. You've got to have strong uh, private uh, sector, private enterprise. You have to have strong, um, um, vibrant, uh, muscular civil society of which philanthropy is a part. Uh, and as Mark said so well, that, that private investment that is not um, uh, in any way uh, 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 captured by a political, uh, captured by a need uh, to get something done before the election so the governor or the president can get credit for it. All of the kinds of things that drive political decision-making, the wonder, the joy of philanthropy is that we can invest for the long haul. We can invest in the unpopular. We can invest in the thing for which there is no market uh, return. We can invest in the things that um, make it difficult. Often people can't even imagine. Um, we can do that kind of investment in society when there is no other means for that. So colleagues, uh, you know, I wanna switch the debate again because it's an interesting thing um, until now we've spoken about hope, how to create hope, and how we could use philanthropy to enable hope or empowerment uh, of marginalized and poor communities. And I think that's important. But you know, I, I wanna bring, we started off the conversation, Darren, with Martin Luther King, and I wanna perhaps towards the end, bring Nelson Mandela into the conversation. Mm -hmm. Because Nelson Mandela raises something interesting in the South African context. 
that he says, as much as you need to empower the, the poor and to empower marginalized communities, the real genius of Madiba was to uh, win over mainstream white society, if you like, and make democracy less of a threat to them. Uh, so how do you deal with mainstream society to show, to demonstrate to people that our collective future is in us coming together? Now, in many ways, that, that has come at a cost in South Africa because of the deep inequality, and a lot of people are fairly angry. But when I look outside South Africa, and I agree with much of that in South Africa, the deep inequality that we haven't taken social justice seriously in South Africa. But when I look in outside South Africa, and I look at the fact that 73 million people voted for Trump in the United States, that when I look at the, the body of opinion that comes out in favor of conservative movements in Western Europe, the fact that Le Pen can win the kinds of support in France, or the fact that so many people in the UK voted to exit Europe. I have to ask the question, are we doing enough to win over mainstream society to the collective project of our future? Because if we don't do that, we remain in the polarized environment we continue to be in. And frankly, to be honest, our inequalities today are what they were 100 years ago. 100 years ago, the world descended into fascism and world war. We've got to avoid that. And that's going to be part empowerment of the poor to get them leverage, but in part it's to reduce the threat that exists in mainstream society. Is that something that worries you as an organization? I know Mark said nobody has the ultimate truth that we need to have voices multiplicity of voices are. But I wanna know if that's something that worries you. And is that something that you're constantly grappling with and figuring out how to handle? Mark and then Darren. Look, it's an extraordinarily profound and important question, Adam. I mean, and, and I would just to bear my soul or bear OSF's institutional soul for a moment, say that, you know, there are, you know, there, there are two competing narratives of change about this in terms of our US program. Uh, there is the one which says, you know, that the modern Republican party has so betrayed democratic norms in its capture by Donald Trump, that, you know, you've just got to build a progressive majority which holds power in the US and by holding power forces the Republicans to reform themselves and come back to the center. That, that is one theory. The second theory, which I confess I am more attracted to, comes very close to what you're saying, which is, you know, as a foundation, we really have to buy, invest in a responsible bipartisan America, if you like, uh, one where that white middle-class fear of uh, loss of prestige, job status, economic power, you know, is somehow mitigated and contained uh, so that American democracy does, is, is rescued from this extraordinary polarization that it, it is currently captured by. And yet the problem with those of us who argue for that second strategy is there aren't obvious easy entry points at the moment uh, to find those levers to rebuild a responsible bipartisanship. Uh, and so, you know, I'm sure it's the way to go. And Madiba's, the example from South Africa, is remains such a compelling one for all of us uh, that, you know, I, I think the ultimate success of American democratic renewal will be a Madiba-like strategy, which, you know, sort of helps people over the fear threshold of their own changed economic status while bringing up those who've been excluded from economic power in the past. But at the moment, we're at that, you know, not just in the United States, but in so many countries in the world, at that moment of, you know, explosive uh, partisan 
um, polarization, that, you know, finding that middle and rebuilding bridges and ties, you know, seems very, very challenging and difficult to do. David? I think that uh, this is a profound, fundamental question. And let's just look at our two societies of South Africa and the United States uh, for the purposes of, of this moment, because Adam, you and I are, these are our homes. South Africa was inspired by Madiba, but South Africa is a different context in the United States. White South Africans knew, uh, they knew culturally and they knew from just looking around them that they were a small minority and that it was simply untenable to sustain the level of inequality and inhumanity that uh, had been visited upon the vast majority of its black citizens, that it was simply not possible. And they accepted that, didn't mean that they believed it. Uh, it didn't mean that they didn't uh, rely on the, uh, the same kind of ethnic um, uh, migration. I mean, uh, look at the numbers that migrated to the Western Cape. Um, um, and, and so, the U.S. is different. Whites in the U.S. remain a majority of the voters. Whites in the U.S. do not believe generally that what happened in this country was so horrible, our racial history, slavery. In fact, some have created a romantic narrative about the period of slavery um, to justify the lost cause and all of these ideas. So we have a very different cultural context. Um, there are many whites who just believe that while it was horrible, it was terrible, it was necessary to build this great country, that we have what we had, but we've overcome it. And let's not worry about what happened in the past. Let's, as we Americans who are always optimistic, let's just look forward. That is very hard to do because of inequality and the long-term impacts of inequality and the racialized dichotomy of the ways in which inequality has manifest in our society. But we do believe, I do believe, that democracy is the greatest threat to racism and white supremacy. And I think because of that, we saw, we saw on January 6th, we saw people responding to this idea that democracy might become more inclusive, might become in the case of a state like Georgia, you would have a Jewish and black man representing that state in the United States Senate. For some, that was simply unthinkable. And for some, if given the choice of that America or no America, they're willing to burn it down they're willing to violate it. They're willing to invade it. They're willing to defecate in it to simply demonstrate their disdain, their appall at the idea that America could be truly inclusive in that way. And I think that's the fight. Yes, in Europe, there is nationalism and xenophobia and racism. But in the United States, we have a particular challenge. I believe that democracy can prevail and can save us from ourselves if we actually believe in democracy. 
So colleagues, I mean, we, we've, we've got about five minutes left and perhaps I should uh, give uh, Andrea a minute or two if she wants to say anything. And then I'll close up, Andrea. Um, I think that's uh, just where Darren ended, really. It's so, uh, you know, the, we've discussed today empowerment, mobilization. We've talked about accountability, transparency, and, and participation, and the voices of the, the voiceless people, enabling people to be able to be heard. But it's a two way street. We need to be able to have a relationship then between institutions and those people that is a more just and socially just uh, set of contracts and arrangements. And I think this, you know, something that's been really interesting to take out of the conversation today. It's just what's needed and what the role of the foundations are that help to put some of those building blocks in place that, that create that stronger relationship. So it's been very inspiring. So, I mean, thank you, uh, both Mark and, and Darren. I must say, Mike, it, it's, it's always difficult to summarize a conversation as nuanced and complex as this. I mean, if I, I was going to say something, it's the following. It's, it's clear that the past continues to live in the present. Mm. Uh, the past of, of slavery, the past of deep racism and marginalization, and how that has continued to reproduce itself in generation after generation, in places like the United States, in other parts of the world, but definitely in places like my home country, South Africa. And that if we're going to uh, address that future, if we're going to have a collective future, we have to disrupt, disrupt this continuous reproduction uh, of inequality. And social justice philanthropy, what both your organizations stand for, is one attempt to do that. But if it's going to really do that, it has to go beyond the norm of simply giving as, it previously, as we previously collectively gave. But giving in a way that empowers, giving in a way that disrupts, giving in a way that changes the very nature of the structural dimensions of our society, both at the municipal, at the national, and even at the global level. The challenge is a great one. You know, a hundred years ago, about this time, actually, we had come out of World War I, and we had inequalities that are equivalent to what exists today. And the failures of, of, of both uh, our institutions, our leaders to address that resulted in war and the murder of millions. And that war, I want to, uh, I want to make clear, was led by what was a dominant superpower at that time. It was a substantive, it was an organization of the North, it was Germany, which had uh, perhaps the the greatest of, of, of institu academic institutions, the greatest of economic institutions, the greatest in many ways of civic, civic life. And they led one of the, the greatest challenges of the last hundred years. And so in a sense, we need to learn that lesson. We need to take social justice seriously. We need to take empowerment seriously. But most of all, we need to deal with the structural dimension of inequality. And so I, I want to end there because I think it's an important point uh, where we started from is we've got to take inequality seriously. We've got to look at your organizations, but your organizations only have the resources for a small element of it. You truly meant to spark a change, a fundamental change in society. And so thank you for the conversation. Thank you for, for taking difficult questions. Thank you for, for the honesty of your engagements. And may we collectively in your institutions, in, in my institutions, in all of our institutions, collectively work to agenda of a better world and a more equitable world, a world where all of us have a collective future and all of us have a collective agenda. So thank you again, Darren. Thank you, Mark, for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam, Andrea. Indeed, thank you. Bye, colleagues. And thank you to everybody in the audience. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>